So um, we have got this week's portion, this week's parasha, Kiti Sa. So I have talked about this, I think, um, in previous years, about the intercession of Moses, because you know, he does it so many times for the people of Israel, just you know, pleading on behalf of Israel to God to you know, forgive them most of the time or save them from different things. Um, but this parasha really, really um, um, I think is the best example, example um, or actually a couple of times, the best couple of examples um, that we have throughout all the scriptures of Moses interceding for the people, the children of Israel. So um, the main readings are on the screen, you can see over there, but um, what I'd like to do is um, give a brief summary of the portion first, and in particular the summary of the main event, which is the um, Golden Calf episode, and then um, after that we'll just talk about a few pertinent themes. So the main events um, of this portion is we've got um, a census. Um, everyone okay? No. Sorry, we had a little bit of an accident here. Sorry. All right, I think it's okay. All right, we can continue. So um, we see in this portion that um, God commands a census. So many times um, Israel did their own census and um, were actually punished for it, and God didn't um, agree with that. But this time God commanded it, and um, that was in the first part of the portion. We've also got here um, two very special craftsmen. So any of you who are tradies who are watching this, so these tradies got the Spirit of God working within them to do all the craft work of the tabernacle, so that's pretty special. So um, he gave two craftsmen um, this particular gift, uh, Betzalel and Oholiav. And interestingly, so Betzalel, the name actually means in Hebrew, in the shadow of. So it's actually a, a way of... Um, you know, some of the commentaries say it actually shows his humility because even though they had, were gifted these special gifts by God to do the work of the tabernacle, they were always in God's shadow and, God's ability, uh, and God, it was God's abilities through them to make the tabernacle. So um, it hints at his humility as well. He didn't see himself as being so special compared to the other craftsmen. He was working in God's shadow. And of course, the main event, the sin of the golden calf, um, Egel Hazahav in Hebrew. So it's actually over a few chapters, so we can't read every single scripture. So what I've done is I've summarized the events um, in sort of an easy-to-follow format. So that's what we'll go through first. So um, I'll give my summary of Exodus 32 to 34, and we'll start at the very start. Basically, Moses has gone up to the mountain. If you remember, um, the Ten Commandments, the, the Torah was given earlier, and then Moses went up for 40 days and 40 nights. Um, he's still on the mountain. The people of Israel... Um, down below, um, were becoming impatient. They're wondering, where was Moses? Why hasn't he come back yet? And there's a whole different discussion in the, in the commentaries about this, but we don't have time today. But that's an interesting thing to look up if you have time. And then basically the people approach Aharon um, and ask him to make them gods. So in the Hebrew, it's actually gods in the plural. And they wanted these gods to lead them. And then, again, another very interesting discussion in the commentaries is about um, Aharon's response. Some of them really blame him very harshly. Some of them are understanding of him. Whatever it is, um, Aharon asks for donations. And then from the donations of gold, he fashions a golden calf. And then um, the, the people come down to worship it. And they make a huge commotion, a big party. Lots of sin is happening. And then um, Moses comes back. He sees that. And then he gets very angry. He smashes the tablets. Prior to this, God did warn him when he was on the mountain that this is happening. But he, when he sees it, face to face, he gets yeah, overcome with emotion and he breaks the tablets. Um, and then after that, about 3,000 um, of the main ringleaders were killed by Moses and his allies. Um, God wants to destroy the entire nation initially, but then um, Moses intercedes and um, he intercedes, um, to, uh, I will talk about that a bit later on, but he intercedes and saves the nation from destruction and saves them from God's wrath. But God forgives but also says there will be a punishment in the form of his presence being removed. So um, he says that he'll now send his angel among the people, not his own presence. But again, Moses intercedes and then God relents on that as well. And then he actually does bring his presence back. And then um, when, the, so when the tabernacle is finished, his presence actually rested upon it. And then um, as a reward to Moses, God shows him the back of his form. So that's actually really an amazing privilege, you know, Normal, normal men, normal, um, you know, normal mortals cannot see the form of God, obviously, and still be alive. Moses was able to see the back of the form because he was, you know, on a very special high level with God. Um, but 
of course, even he couldn't see the front because then he would also have to be killed as well. And then new tablets um, were made and then um, the covenant is reaffirmed as well. So that's essentially the summary of these chapters. Um, I do want to talk about um, Moses' intercession because I really think this is the main point, the main lesson that we can learn. So we can actually see that his intercession saved the people. He was over and over and over again putting himself on the line. So it's interesting to note that when God was threatening to destroy the people, he didn't threaten to destroy Moses. He said that from Moses he would make a new nation. And it's interesting, you know, um, I guess, you know, think of any of us, what we would do in this situation, we've got a very angry God. And we know that he was very angry because in Exodus 32 verse 7, excuse me, um, the Lord said to Moses, um, go down for your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. Which is interesting because um, why would God say your people? Because obviously they were his people and he was the one who brought them out. Um, now, the best, and the way the commentaries explain this, and actually this is quite common sense, is if you think about it, um, let's say, you know, I don't have any kids, but for all of you guys who have kids, you've got, like, let's say your kids do something really bad, and the kids, like, break something, and then, like, one spouse says to the other spouse, oh, your child did that, and they say that because, like, oh, they're angry, you know, they're angry at the child. Um, you know, it's not something I can relate to, but apparently that's a thing. So, um, it's, so the, the commentaries actually explain it like that in the sense that God was so angry, he didn't want to associate himself with the people. So he said, it's your people, deal with it, essentially. Um, so we know God was really angry. But Moses still, anyway, you know, getting in the way of that, you know, Moses getting in the way of that could have directed God's wrath upon himself and he, and he wasn't the initial target. So it shows really he was very courageous, very loving and very, you know, a, an amazing leader for the people of Israel. I don't think any of our leaders today would go to those lengths to protect their people. And um, I want to now just move on to um, the way that Moses inter interceded. So I've actually gotten a lot of benefit from reading the commentary of Dennis Prager. So I'm, I'm not sure if, I mean, some of you guys will have heard of Dennis Prager. He's, um, he has a very um, significant um, presence online. He's a conservative com social commentator, among many other things. One of the many other things that he does is he also um, he's writing a commentary on the Torah. It's not based on a sort of messianic. He's not messianic. He's you know he's not messianic at all. Um, he's not um, particularly religious, but he writes in a very um, affirming way, and he writes it in a very um, rational way, which I really found beneficial. And his his insights are actually quite interesting, and he borrows from different sources too. So um, I'll cite his arguments. Um, so his um, understanding of the arguments. So in his understanding, Moses in Exodus 32, 11 to 13, gave three arguments to God um, as his way of interceding for the people. So in Exodus 32, verse 11, we read, but Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? It was interesting because God's reminding, God was saying, it's, no, it's your people, Moses, but no, Moses is reminding God no, actually, it's your people. You brought them out. And you just redeemed them. So, you know, therefore, why would you destroy a nation which you just saved? His second argument is from the next verse, th verse 12. And it says, Why should the Egyptians say, with evil intent did he bring them out, to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. So this is the, um, using the idea of um, Chilul Hashem, so desecrating God's name. And that's a grave sin in, in Judaism, is basically to do something or say something which would cause offense or cause God's reputation to be, um, you know, to be destroyed or to be damaged. And basically what Moses is saying here, people will think you'll be a, you're a cruel, unkind, evil God by doing this. Why should you damage your reputation by doing this? So that's um, his second appeal. His final appeal is in the next verse, verse 13, and it says, Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self, and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have promised I will give to your offspring, and they shall inherit it forever. And that's the idea, very common in Judaism, of zechut avot, which is the, um, the merit of the fathers. And we know this because God promised throughout Genesis to the various patriarchs that he will fulfill these promises um, through their descendants. And he's basically saying, you know, Moses is saying to God, you know, you can't really fulfill your promises to them if you kill them all. 
So um, it's as simple as that. So these are the three arguments, and of course, God was moved by that. Even though he was furious with Israel, and furious um, perhaps even with Moses, God not only tolerates him, but actually listens to him. And um, it's actually a really amazing point, which I will draw out later, but um, God listens to Moses, and he actually expresses his mercy, and he expresses his forgiveness over Israel after this discussion with Moses. And it's a really a, a amazing trait if you just compare to how people would respond. People would not respond like this. If someone's angry, it's very difficult to reason with them. If someone's really, really angry, if their emotions have really overtaken them, it's very hard to reason with them. I mean, some people it happens more quickly than other people, but it happens to everybody after a certain point. But with God, you know, one of his great attributes is he's slow to anger. And even when he's angry, he's merciful and patient, which is really, really amazing to learn about God. And if we note, actually, um, there's actually many scriptures which actually point to that as a particular um, attribute of God. And one of the scriptures is actually from later on in this portion as well. And it's interesting, when God renounces the punishment, the word in Hebrew, yinachem, is used. So yinachem means renounce, but also can mean regret. So another way of reading the passage would be that God regretted um, you know, making that punishment against the people in the first place. So that's actually really, um, you know, an interesting, um, sh interesting like shadow, interesting shade of the of the issue. In a sense that, so you could understand it as saying um, Moses made God regret his choice to punish the people like that, which is a very interesting way of looking at it. Instead of being convinced rationally to renounce it, it puts it more on a personal, intimate, emotional level. Um, when God says that he will um, forgive the people but not send his presence among them, um, sending an angel instead, God, uh, Moses again pleads with God, intercedes again, and then God relents. So again, really, if you read through the chapters, it's actually really amazing. Like, it's basically Moses begging, begging, begging God to like, restore the original relationship prior to the golden calf sin. And what can we learn from Moses? What can we learn and what can we learn about what, how we should behave and also um, how God behaves? So, I think the first thing for us is also, it's a great example of true sacrificial love. So, as I mentioned previously before, um, he was willing to sacrifice his personal welfare and risk his personal safety for the sake of his nation. So, as we note, his, the original wrath was not directed against Moses per se. He was going to survive and he was going to father a new nation. In fact, actually, it would have benefited Moses because he would have been the patriarch of a new nation. But, um, and if, by, by saying something, God could have potentially directed his wrath upon Moses himself. But um, Moses took that risk for the, on behalf of the people. And by saying things like this, like, do not bring us out of here. So, um, basically, Moses was saying, yeah, if you don't um, come with us, don't bring us out of the desert, which means the people of Israel would have been stuck in the desert forever, which is, of course, that's um, not only bad for the people, but also bad for Moses. So, again, sacrificing his personal safety and his personal well-being. And also, he even says to God, blot me out of your book if you do this. So, to wipe himself completely from the memory of Israel forever. That's, again, that shows really his personal sacrifice in leading this nation, a really difficult nation to lead. So, Again, I, I, uh, I think we should learn from Moses and implement that in our lives as well. And in particular, for our lives, um, I'll just go to the next slide, please, if that's okay. Um, our intercession in other people's lives is very important. So I believe that, excuse me, of course Moses wasn't a very high level, but through the good news and through um, the Holy Spirit being poured out onto all flesh, who accept Yeshua, um, we can intercede for other people, and also not only we can, it's also very important because through um, the example of Moses um, talking to God, we say that God does listen and God does consider what we have to say. And we can plead with God on behalf of others in our lives. So indeed, um, you know, God is omnipotent, He is all-knowing, but He does consider us. And there are a couple of scriptures in the New Testament, in the Brit Halasha, that I want to go through which illustrate this point. Not only that we can, but also that we should. So in James chapter 5, verses 14 to 16, it says, Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Therefore, confess your sins to one another, and pray for one another, so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of the righteous man can accomplish much. 
Again, that's, that, that can be difficult for us to accept in, this, in the face that there are many people who we pray for who are sick, who don't get better. But um, you know, we are commanded in the Brich HaLashah to believe in faith that this will be done for us. And of course, we have seen many examples, of course, of also miraculous healings as well. Another example I'll point to is in the book of Acts, chapter 7, verses 59 to 60. It's Stephen talking as, they were about to be, as he was about to be stoned. As they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Yeshua, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Even when his brethren, brethren was, um, sorry, he fell asleep. So this is interesting because even when his brethren um, were stoning him for the crime of believing in Yeshua, he still pleads for mercy on their behalf. And that's the power, I think that's the power of the Holy Spirit working through him in the sense that he's, um, you know, he still has that attitude towards his nation. And of course Yeshua had that, um, and that'll be my next point. My next point is um, the ultimate um, intercessor we have is Yeshua, which I will talk about that last. But um, we also very much need an intercessor. So if we had to approach God directly, if the nation of Israel had to approach God directly, they would have been destroyed. They would have been gone by now. Israel was a stiff-necked people, <clears throat> but if you look at our lives, we all commit sins and all have committed sins which are worthy of punishment and worthy of death even. And we, so we all need like, someone like Moses to intercede for us. If we were too arrogant and said we don't need someone, we can approach God directly, then I really feel like we'd all be worthy of death by now. And we will, probably all would have been destroyed in some way. In the sense that, um, you know, in, in Judaism and argu arguments against Yeshua is that we don't need someone like him. But I think our history shows that we do. And we would have been destroyed over and over again if we didn't have it. And I think um, the good news is that we have someone like that. And that good news comes with the gospel. And the gospel is that the ultimate intercessor of the whole world is Yeshua. And um, just taking on from the Stephen example, Yeshua himself also, uh, through his life, he shows that he... Um, had sacrificial love for his nation when, and also for the whole world when he was being um, crucified. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Well, that's in Luke 23. And through his death, he made the way for all people, not only the Israelites, but for all people around the world to be given mercy and be forgiven of their sins, even those worse and of greater number than those um, that Israel committed in the desert as well. The example of Moses is truly magnificent, but these things are only a shadow of the realities experienced in the Messiah. And that's what we know from the book of Hebrews, chapter 7 through 9. So I'd love to like just leave us with this mental picture of if this example of Moses that we read so graphically is so, so powerful and amazing, but we know from the Brich HaLashah that it's only a shadow of the things in Yeshua, then the intercession we have through Yeshua is truly glorious. And I'll leave it there. Um, we'll continue with the service.